Yes, we're good. Everybody, we're good. Good, good morning. <laughs> Sorry about all that. So after that uh, brief um, adventure, we will start off on today's topic. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about clinical eye transplantation, um, its evolution, progress, and future directions. And um, I do not have any conflicts to declare. So I'll briefly go over some of the history um, of uh, eyelid transplantation and eyelids themselves, the structure and function of eyelids, uh, go through the basics of uh, eyelid transplants, uh, auto and allo transplantation, and uh, outcomes, um, and the limitations and potential solutions uh, to the problems that exist. So one of the things that is um, interesting about diabetes is that some of the major discoveries in uh, diabetes, uh, two of them, the discovery of islets and the discovery of insulin, uh, were by students. One was Paul Langerhans, who di described the islets of Langerhans, and uh, he was a doctoral student uh, when he discovered this. Um, he did not, of course, call it a, a endocrine uh, cell, but it was subsequently identified as an endocrine organ. And then, of course, uh, we all know that uh, Banting and Best discovered insulin. Um, so this is give you a brief uh, timeline uh, of the, I mean, it's a composite timeline, so I'll not go through every piece of it, um, but simply to point out that the first islet transplant was actually attempted in 1892. Um, of course, it was not successful, and subsequent to that, much of the focus had been in trying to isolate um, uh, the insulin secreting cells of the pancreas, uh, then you know, bits and fragments of the pancreas were introduced, and subsequently over time there has been a lot of progress mainly in the field of trying to isolate these better uh, using different techniques. And in, in terms of the clinical islet transplantation, really much of the progress uh, has been in the last 40 years or so. Uh, prior to that, it was mostly um, in animal transplants, both rats and pigs, that the allo transplants were done. Um, human allo transplantation has been uh, really um, been a lot of progress made uh, since 2001, when actually uh, Dr. Shapiro and colleagues at Edmonton developed the uh, non-steroid immunosuppression protocol. Uh, that helped increase the uh, survival of islets after transplantation. So the Edmonton protocol uh, had an almost 100% insulin independence. It was a small series, but really showed us that uh, if you use a specific immunosuppression protocol, that you can avoid some of the problems that lead to islet failure uh, with the previous uh, immunosuppression protocols. And then, you know, in 2016, um, then I completed the, uh, the phase three multicenter studies of islet transplantation, uh, showing that uh, it is possible to um, you know, transplant it in a, on a clinical setting and obtain results that are uh, favorable to the patients with diabetes. So uh, this is a long timeline. Many things have um, gone on during this period. But we still have uh, significant problems in making this a uh, day-to-day -day reality. So the first thing that I want to bring up to the, uh, everyone's attention is simply to understand what the islet is. Because a lot of times people call it an islet cell transplant or that they simply think of islet as a, just a cluster of insulin secreting cells. But the reality is that the islets um, are microorganisms. Uh, they approximately uh, form about 1% of the pancreas. Uh, one of the interesting things is that despite there being only 1%, they have 15% of the pancreatic blood supply. And the reason for that is because they're highly metabolically active. And like any other endocrine gland, you need blood vessels to deliver the uh, hormone into the circulation. Uh, but the vascularity of the islet is important in many other ways, including in the regulation of insulin secretion, interaction between different uh, subtypes of cells within the pancreas. And that is something that is important because uh, when we transplant a liver or kidney or heart, we just don't cut it out and throw it in somewhere, hoping that it will reestablish its connections. These connections are very small vessels, 
but still, you know, these are very important. There are approximately 1 million islets um, in the pancreas, uh, and each of them have about 2,500 cells. Um, the size might vary. The, the organization of these islets uh, have a clear homeostatic benefit. Uh, they are, the organization is slightly different between uh, animals, and I'll come to that a bit later. Uh, these islet crustlers have alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, uh, pancreatic polypeptide cells, epsilon cells, and these synthesize and release glucagon, insulin, somatostatin, pancreatic polypeptide, ghrelin, and they are all in a nutrient-dependent fashion. So it's a very uh, well-organized and interrelated structure. And um, there's communication between these, which is very critical to our understanding of islet function and also uh, how you know, they work after transplantation or uh, when, uh, how they don't work when the transplants fail. So this is just to show you that some of the uh, architecture here uh, on, on the left, uh, we have the rodent uh, islet, which has a different, slightly different structure in which the core, uh, and then you have the peripheral cells, and then you have the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers uh, that regulate, uh, and you have blood vessels, uh, which are regulated by these uh, ner nerve cells. Um, and then the human islet, which has a, a more, um, the distribution of the islet is not as clear cut as in the uh, rodent islet. Uh, but, and also you see that there's fewer parasympathetic cells and mostly sympathetic um, you know, fibers that are there uh, within the human islet. So there are these differences, but this structure is important for maintaining a well-regulated uh, function of the islets um, to you know, control nutrient metabolism. So the islets, you can see here, they have the endocrine cells, they have stromal cells, there are vascular cells, there are immune cells and neural cells. And these are all important for maintaining normal function. Uh, both the autonomic nervous system and the and D cells uh, account for additional you know, pathways uh, to regulate uh, glucagon secretion and also insulin secretion. Um, so glucose homeostasis is uh, a dynamic process, and multiple cell types contained within these uh, unassuming microorganisms are what really um, uh, regulate uh, glucose metabolism. So it's um, one of the key uh, parts of this is the vascular endothelial cells, and this has been an interest of um, uh, here in Louisville uh, for a long time. Uh, including now uh, with the work that is ongoing by Bala and others. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge my uh, mentors uh, here in Louisville. Uh, Ellis Samuels was our uh, previous chief, he, uh, chief here. Um, when I came here to Louisville, uh, this is his obituary that came, it was published in Lancet uh, in 2006. And one of the main contributions that L. Uh, Samuels and um, his um, uh, co-investigator, uh, Dr. Um, John Stagner, did was they demonstrated that each individual islet of Langerhans uh, is an elaborate functional unit. Uh, they were the ones who kind of helped uh, advance the idea of a microorgan, and also uh, the, the showed the interaction between uh, the different cells within the uh, islet, and, all, uh, and more importantly, the important role of uh, the vascularity and the site of islet transplant, and especially demonstrating the, uh, the role of the pancreas site itself as very important for adequate islet function. So a significant factor, as I said, is the uh, revascularization of transplanted islets. Uh, because islets are typically transplanted intrahepatically. Uh, there is a delay and in insufficient va revascularization uh, that will deprive the islets of oxygen and nutrients, resulting in islet cell death and early graft failure. So within the islets, the intra-islet endothelial cells are responsible for release of uh, proangiogenic factors, uh, which will draw in blood vessels. And uh, there is recent evidence that the endothelial cells creating new capillaries uh, arise from various sources, 
uh, and this is important and a lot of um, effort has been uh, made in recent years to try to understand this promote revascularization or develop other ways by which uh, we can uh, increase the vascular supply uh, to the transplanted uh, islets. So um, this is uh, something that I'll talk about a bit uh, later. Also, you must understand that our current understanding of islets uh, has increased uh, considerably over the last 20 years with the recognition that uh, the whole unit that you know, individual beta cells, uh, there is significant uh, diversity. And then there are what are called hub beta cells, which are the ones that have more glucokinase, so they, they uh, rapidly respond to glucose changes. And then they in turn regulate what they call the follower beta cells. So, you know, some of the uh, important things is that even though we may be able to get a certain number of islets or beta cells to function, you know, they, it is important to also preserve what you call hub beta cells. So our understanding of islets has uh, considerably increased, and um, there is a certain complexity of um, islets that um, uh, is important for us to maintain during the process of islet transplantation. So after giving you a brief introduction, simply to say that the islets are a complex organ uh, or microorgan. Um, I'll go over what is the basics of I mean, how is the islet uh, transplanted, and then go to the different types of islet transplant and what the uh, results are. So this is just to illustrate, you know, the basic pro process that is done. Uh, basically, when the pancreas is taken out, um, it is uh, extended and it is uh, perfused with collagenase, and then it is, you know, uh, in um, in the human islet transplant in the recorded chamber, um, it is allowed to digest. And uh, these are this is just a picture of the pancreatic digest before purification. It then goes through a process of density gradient centrifugation so that the islets will float up to the top, and then they are then uh, taken and transplanted. The islet culture portion of it um, is typically done for uh, aloe transplants, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. Uh, and then the highly purified human islets are then transplanted uh, through the portal vein um, into the uh, liver. So, so this is the basic uh, process that occurs. Um, so, uh, so, so that you know the islets are actually, for the most part, deposited uh, within the uh, uh, liver. So in the case of an autotransplantation, uh, these are individuals um, who, have had, uh, who, who need to have their pancreas removed. So this is a total pancreatectomy uh, with islet autotransplantation. So the pancreas is resected uh, together with the duodenum and spleen. Um, then um, while the surgeon is continuing to do a gastrojejunostomy and colidocojejunostomy uh, and Roux-NY reconstruction, uh, the uh, pancreas is taken over uh, into a uh, you know, uh, islet isolation facility where it is digested by collagenase and undergoes um, centrifugation and, you know, and uh, some purification. The degree of uh, purification that is needed for the um, you know, uh, autotransplant is not very uh, high. Uh, so, but we can, you know, we compromise um, purity for number. So we get uh, less pure but higher t uh, islet numbers when we do uh, autotransplantation. It is then transplanted intraportally through the splenic vein strump, a mesenteric vein or recanalation of the umbilical vein. Uh, and if there are too many uh, islets so that there is excessive portal pressure, uh, the you know, remaining islets are deposited uh, are, you know, into the peritoneal cavity or other extrahepatic sites. On the other hand, uh, for the allotransplantation, transplantation, uh, there is this process. And of course, there's a donor, a compatible donor, uh, who is non-diabetic. And then you take the uh, pancreas, isolate the uh, islets, and it is usually um, the final product is placed in culture for up to 72 hours prior to it being um, you know, uh, transplanted or 
you know, infused into the portal vein. This is done through interventional radiology or at the most a mini lab to cannulate the, the vein. Um, and then the islets are in a infused uh, into, the, um, uh, into the liver. Um, since Since this process, um, this is considered a, uh, you know, and still considered an experimental procedure. It's not an FDA-approved procedure for a different um, reason, um, in the sense that because it is cultured and it's coming from a different person, uh, not from the same person, uh, it has different regulatory processes. Um, so uh, this is uh, still not full approved by um, insurance companies and by the FDA and that is a long process that uh, is still ongoing and we hope that at some point um, it will be approved. It is a, an approved procedure in many other countries but not uh, in the United States. So for total pancreatectomy and islet autotransplantation, uh, the main indication, the inclusion is uh, these are people with chronic pancreatitis who they're gastroenterologists or pancreatologists um, uh, have diagnosed them with chronic pancreatitis and they agree upon um, getting this procedure done. Uh, they should have had prior procedures that have failed or only provide temporary relief of pain, narcotic dependence uh, for chronic pain due to pancreatitis, and self-reported poor quality of life uh, with use of a formal scale. So these are things that we use for um, uh, selecting patients uh, who should undergo total pancreatectomy uh, and islet transplantation. Uh, of course, the exclusion is uh, presence or suspected malignancy, uh, portal hypertension, significant hepatic fibrosis, cardiac or pulmonary contraindications to any uh, surgical procedure, uh, then the non-prescribed substances use, including alcohol, uh, profound and corrected malnutrition. And we always do a, a assessment of their islet function because if they are C-peptide negative um, during a glucose tolerance or a meal tolerance test, we will not be able to perform uh, this procedure because there will be no functional islets that are left. Even if they have mild diabetes but have functional islets and they are C-peptide positive, uh, the procedure can be done. Uh, and as said, it is uh, uh, they are not considered a manufactured biological product uh, by the FDA. So it can be done uh, with a, you know, a lab which is a GDP uh, and does not need stringent uh, manufacturing requirements as we need for allotransplantation. So the actual whole process um, is outlined here. You have the um, initial evaluation prior to, uh, to the procedure itself, evaluation for candidacy, diabetes education, uh, laboratory testing, including a meal tolerance test uh, to make sure that they have adequate islet function. Um, so immediately after surgery, and in fact, uh, during the surgery itself, uh, we have, they have started on an insulin drip because it is very important to maintain good glycemic control uh, in the first few days and uh, weeks after uh, islet transplantation. Uh, high glucose will um, kill the islets, so it's very important for us to maintain tight glucose control until there is engraftment and um, you know, functioning of the islets. So you know, initially, of course, they are on a drip, then they are transitioned to subcutaneous uh, insulin, then they are on tube feeds for, uh, and eventually discharged home on tube feeds. Then we have follow-ups where we adjust their insulin dose and gradually taper them off uh, and adjust their uh, diet accordingly. And then between three to 12 months is when we try to eventually wean them off of the insulin whenever appropriate. And we, um, you know, are followed subsequently uh, every three to six months to make sure that the islets uh, are continuing to function uh, at whatever level that they are able to do so. So this is a comparison of the, um, you know, published uh, high volume centered experiences with total pancreatectomy and islet autotransplant. Uh, the highest, uh, the, the largest experience is with the University of Minnesota. Um, and of course, the others have fewer. You can see that you know the the amount of data that we have is not uh, as good as we want it to be because not all the centers have collected uh, all the information that we need. But one of the things that you see is that um, the insulin independence is 
anywhere, you know, about 25 to 40 percent uh, insulin independence at two years. Um, so, you know, roughly a third of the patients who undergo this procedure will be insulin independent. Uh, but at the same time, it is important to recognize that uh, there is another third in whom the insulin is still required but can maintain fairly good control without um, large fluctuations. And I'll show you a few examples of those. This is a large meta-analysis uh, that uh, reviewed uh, the islet autotransplant after total pancreatectomy and, uh, for pancreatitis. Uh, and you see again, you know, um, the University of Minnesota has the largest number. And uh, you know, one of the things is that, again, you find that the response rate has been um, the, the islet independence rate has, is highly variable. The main factors associated with uh, um, insulin independence uh, uh, is the islet equivalence per kilogram body weight. How many islets can we get and how much can we uh, infuse uh, into the, uh, uh, put it back into the portal vein? Uh, so this is a very uh, important thing. The more we are able to isolate, uh, the better it is. Uh, and you know, systematic reviews suggest that it is a safe modality for chronic pancreatitis patients who need to undergo total pancreatectomy. So the first thing is that they need total pancreatectomy, uh, and that is when we decide whether or not to do islet transplant uh, along with it. A significant number of them will achieve insulin independence for a long time. Uh, these are uh, this experience also from Minnesota. Uh, this is in pediatric population, and again, uh, it has been shown that um, there is a statistical improvement in the symptoms uh, of pain, uh, and about a 41% here achieved insulin independence. Um, and again, you find here that the important things that are, um, you know, the higher total quality uh, allele equivalence per kilogram body weight um, was the single most factor that is uh, strongly associated with insulin independence. So thing is to be able to get more uh, islets out. So we started this program at University of Louisville uh, in 2015. We have done over 50 auto transplants. Um, there are about 100 individuals that we have evaluated. Uh, you know, we are the only one here doing it in um, Kentucky, Indiana, uh, West Virginia, or Tennessee. Uh, Dr. Michael Hughes, um, uh, Bala, um, uh, Stu Williams, they were instrumental in bringing this program to, to Louisville. And it's a multidisciplinary program with strong collaborative effort, including surgery, endocrinology, GI, pain management, psychology, social workers, hospitals, um, and the islet lab, uh, and others. So it's a very uh, uh, coordinated effort that is needed. So we have done the preoperative evaluations, um, then uh, including uh, two, uh, you know, uh, two our a uh, meal tolerance test, and then uh, a multidisciplinary care involving the coordinator team and the uh, CDEs. Post-operative management, in including initiation of enteral feeding, uh, ICU management, uh, and then the pity op um, outpatient management and follow-up. So this is a highly coordinated effort that needs to be uh, done. Of the first uh, 24 individuals that we uh, included, uh, there were, uh, you know, 14 of them who had no diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. Ten of them had uh, diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. Um, so this shows us the. Um, uh, islets that we were able to get. Uh, so those with normal glucose tolerance test got almost about one and a half to two times as many islets uh, as we can get from individuals with um, uh, any type of uh, impairment in glucose tolerance. Of those who did not, uh, who were not on insulin or were not diabetic, uh, six of the 14 were insulin independent. There were some, uh, three of them were actually requiring very small amounts of insulin. Uh, this is our initial experience uh, that we had uh, you know, have not analyzed the most recent uh, data. So even among patients who had some degree of, uh, of some diabetes, allet autotransplantation, uh, you know, we were able to maintain their uh, glycemic control despite uh, having taken out their entire pancreas. Uh, this is the uh, group that did not have diabetes before or and had normal glucose tolerance, 
and they were able to maintain good glycemic control uh, without any exogenous insulin. These are some examples of our patients. So th this is a patient who underwent um, islet autotransplantation and uh, she was C-peptide positive and um, is on an insulin pump, but uses very small amounts of insulin. The total insulin per day is less than six units. And you can see here uh, that uh, the range at which um, the percent in the gold range is about 75%. This is a patient who had um, who is C-peptide negative uh, and is using insulin pump and sensor. You can see that there is a greater variation in blood glucose levels. These are all continuous glucose monitoring systems. Uh, but she also has been able to do reasonably well. Uh, but there is certainly a, a greater fluctuation. Uh, she had a partial pancreatectomy before she had the remaining pancreas taken out. Um, and this is one of our patients uh, who is insulin independent. And you can see here that she has tight control of her blood glucose. The average glucose was 112. Um, some occasional slightly low blood sugars, but this is, so we can see that there is a spectrum of responses, uh, but it can be uh, managed. So, so some of the complications of, uh, from total pancreatectomy or transplant uh, includes, you know, overall the morbidity is higher than just if you do only uh, total pancreatectomy. And, and some of this is related to a higher uh, rate of requiring transfusion. It's a longer length of stay in the hospital, uh, partly related to, um, you know, some more bleeding because we use anticoagulation uh, to prevent portal vein thrombosis. Uh, and also other complications, including real aprotomies, bleeding, anastomotic leaks, uh, intra-abdominal infections, and uh, GI issues. So this is a procedure that does have a higher risk, but the, the benefit uh, is going to be uh, a less severe diabetes to manage. So the quality of life uh, on average has improved after total pancreatic transplantation. Uh, one of the things though is that Gastrointestinal dysmobility and central pain sensitization are recognized factors likely contributing to persistent abdominal pain syndromes after TPIT. So some of them continue to have pain, and that is something that's important for us to recognize and uh, treat subsequently. And um, we're trying to look at uh, you know uh, the factors that are associated with better diabetes outcomes, including younger age at surgery, um, pancreatic calcification, lack of these. Uh, lesser intrapancreatic fact and uh, no calcification gives us better outcomes. And the ability to restore independence uh, from insulin uh, is limited by loss of uh, islets during the isolation stress, hypoxia, and inflammatory response to infusion. So these are things that we uh, are working on to try to uh, improve uh, uh, the outcomes. So this is a study that um, uh, we have been a part of. Um, it is uh, advancing treatment for pancreatitis, a prospective observational study. Uh, it's a multi-center study. It has 450 uh, uh, patients uh, that are being followed across 12 U.S. centers uh, who are performing these uh, specialized procedures. And they include careful assessments before surgery and after surgery. And the main aim here is to look at the character, the patient and disease characteristics associated with favorable, favorable the solution of pain, uh, and also uh, related to quality of life. And the secondary aim is to look at prediction of uh, uh, successful resolution of post-operative uh, diabetes, uh, cost effectiveness. So this is something that is ongoing because uh, although there have been many uh, of these procedures that are done, uh, it is uh, not uh, uniformly uh, successful and not well studied uh, in, a, in a controlled fashion. Now coming to this uh, issue of islet allotransplantation, um, one of the things is that even to this day, even with progress in different types of um, uh, treatment, we find here that um, only about, um, you know, 57 percent uh, will of patients using a sensor augmented insulin pump, which is the most sophisticated uh, treatment that we can give, uh, can offer to our patients with type 1 diabetes, can reach goal um, in, in people over 26. Of course, the younger patients, the uh, percentage of people uh, who um, have I A1Cs that are higher is 
uh, much greater. Um, so over the last uh, 100 years since the discovery of insulin, we went to multiple daily injections, uh, and now we are here with continuous uh, subcutaneous insulin infusion, sensor augmented, you know, uh, pumps with a hybrid closed loop, now our most advanced uh, system that we have. Uh, and then we are now doing beta cell uh, replacement with whole pancreas, which was introduced in the 1960s. Uh, then with isolate the islet transplantation, uh, which became really more popular in uh, since 2000. And these two here, xenogenic or stem cell derived, are future prospects that we have. And then B cell regeneration is the other option to make the patient's own beta cells regenerate. And these are uh, uh, entirely experimental. There is no uh, established way to achieve that. So who are the patients who will qualify for this kind of um, uh, procedure? These are patients who have poor glycemic control. And the most important thing is to have, you know, the, the patients we choose for a islet autotransplant, um, I mean, sorry, islet allotransplant, have hypoglycemia as a major factor, hypoglycemia and awareness, uh, significant time in hypoglycemia, significant amount of glycemic variability. So these are things that uh, are, are um, the pa patient characteristics for islet allotransplantation. Uh, this is an effort uh, by an international group uh, to standardize this uh, thing so that uh, studies can be compared across uh, different centers and different countries so that we have a better idea of, of what works and what does not work. So the proposed indications are the patients are negative for or very low C-peptide, no substance abuse, A1C, um, less than seven, you know, they're lean individuals, uh, and they are uh, have you know, diabetes complications, no malignancies. Uh, for those with preserved islet, uh, preserved kidney function, they get only the islet. Uh, those who have a, a kidney transplant, you can do an islet uh, after kidney transplantation, or you can do simultaneous uh, islet kidney transplantation, or you can do kidney transplant alone. And subsequently, if there is still problems with glycemic control, you can do a, a islet transplant after a kidney transplantation. The goal here is to really optimally get A1C less than 6.5%, have no severe hypoglycemia, uh, no insulin use, and greater than you know, C peptide. Here, the, uh, the good response is less than 7% and no hypoglycemia less than 50% insulin requirement from basal. And this is important to recognize because we are always stuck with insulin independence. But the important thing is if you can get their control good and avoid hypoglycemia, uh, then we will be uh, achieving uh, a lot uh, more than what we currently can do with other modalities of uh, treatment. Um, so this is the uh, overall schema for uh, the management of islet allotransplantation. Main difference is here, of course, the use of immunosuppression uh, um, for the uh, transplantation. And again, you should, you should realize that we need to do intensive insulin control and uh, insulin treatment uh, for patients perioperatively, postoperatively, to preserve islet function uh, until they engraft and start working on their own. So this is the comparison of public results on allotransplantation. And um, you can see here that insulin independence, 45% um, to 50% at one year, uh, and here uh, 46 and 42%. Uh, so uh, the, the insulin independence rate has improved over the last um, 10 years or so, I mean, sorry, the last 20 years or so since the new protocols were introduced. And um, this is um, one and five year metabolic outcomes, you know, uh, since 2004. Uh, this is just a summary to look at the number of studies that have been done. And, and you can see here that the one year median has been, you know, um, just to look at transplant function and insulin independence. Uh, you can see that five year, it has been at median at 40% um, for islet transplant alone and islet after kidney or simultaneous islet kidney uh, has been um, 32%. So uh, there is significant improvement uh, that is noted. So if you look at uh, 
A1C less than 7%, uh, we can get it, and, and these are uh, without any hypoglycemia, um, at one year it's almost 86%. So there is significant improvement in uh, function and uh, success with islet uh, transplantation. So this is just to illustrate one of the uh, NIH studies that looked at, uh, it's a phase three uh, trial of transplantation for of purified human islets, um, complicated by severe hypoglycemia. So these are patients who have had uh, recurrent episodes of severe hypoglycemia requiring hospitalization. Um, so here you can see here, uh, the primary endpoint here is getting A1C level to less than 7%. And you can see there is a significant improvement, over 85% uh, at, at one year, and this is at, at two years, uh, it's uh, about 70%. This is the thing looking at uh, the secondary endpoint, um, which is, um, you know, uh, the percent who have uh, reached um, goal A1C of less than 6.5%. Uh, this is, again, close to 80% and 75% here. Then the, the third one um, is looking at um, A1C uh, less than 7%. And this one here is looking at the A1C overall. And you can see significant reductions in the A1C. Uh, and um, E here is severe hypoglycemia. You can see a marked reduction in hypoglycemic uh, episodes. Of course, all of them had hypoglycemic episodes, 100% of them. They were selected. They were had, all had severe hypoglycemia. And you can get it down to almost, you know, less than 5%. So there's a market reduction in hypoglycemia. So that's one of the primary uh, uh, population that we try to treat our patients uh, with severe hypoglycemia. So the primary endpoint was successfully met uh, at 87.5% and 71% at two years. A1C median was 5.6%. Uh, hypoglycemia awareness was restored with highly significant improvement in Clark and Hypo scores. Uh, there was no uh, study-related uh, death or disability. Uh, five enrollees had some excessive bleeding and transfusion. Uh, GFR rate decreased significantly on immunosuppression, which is one of the well-known complications of um, immunosuppression. So transplanted, you know, uh, purified uh, human pancreatic islets can provide uh, glycemic control, restoration of hypoglycemia and events, and protection from severe hypoglycemic events in subjects with intractable um, hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia and awareness. So this is um, an important step uh, towards um, making this a more feasible uh, procedure. So one of the problems, though, uh, is that uh, this is still not an FDA-approved procedure. It's not covered by insurance. The biggest stumbling block uh, is the fact that it is considered an experimental procedure, so you can only get this if you're in some sort of a clinical trial. Uh, one of the major issues is long-term immunosuppression, the cost related to it. So, you know, we are in this field very hopeful that someday this will be an approved procedure and we can have more of these patients uh, able to uh, uh, make use of this uh, procedure. With advances in uh, other types of uh, treatment, we certainly can get them uh, get more and more uh, people um, treated by, uh, you know, closed-loop pumps and others, but there are still significant number who, of type 1 diabetics who are, have recurrent hypoglycemia who will benefit from an, um, uh, from an allotransplantation. So the characteristics that are important here is the donor characteristics, uh, warm ischemia time, chlor ischemia time, preservation and transportation that increase in, affect the islet mass. Then you have the isolation technique um, that is used. And then, of course, the loss of islets that uh, can happen, uh, the immediate blood-mediated uh, inflammatory response, uh, allogenic rejection, and recurrent uh, autoimmunity. So the drawbacks of islet transplantation is the failed engraftment. Some of it is related, you know, the, some of the solutions to it could be an alternative islet transplant site. Uh, local therapy to increase uh, islet vasculariz va vascularization, co-transplantation of mesenchymal stem cells, which in turn regulate revascularization and islet uh, cell uh, function, uh, use of immuno uh, isolation devices, uh, using less toxic immunosuppressant regimens, 
And of course, you have, you know, uh, pancreatic or you know, embryonic stem cells and uh, uh, xeno transplantation. So the current approach is here that what we are doing, uh, we can change the beta cell source with xeno transplants or uh, stem cells. Uh, transplantation sites, there are, there's a lot of work going on to use bioscaffolds, uh, intramuscular site, and then prepare, preparing the site um, of transplantation at a subcutaneous site with uh, deviceless space or cell permeable or impermeable spaces. And then immunoprotection using uh, these techniques of induction of immunomodulation or immunoisolation and macroencapsulation. So in the chronic uh, pancreatitis, one of the problems that we have is when to choose them uh, for, for the procedure because more fibrosis, more calcification, more difficult to isolate. Then you have the problem of um, uh, you know, mechanical stress, so the technique of islet, uh, isolation needs to be improved. And uh, there is this peritransplant inflammation, uh, which is an important source of islet loss. Um, another rare complication is this post uh, islet cell hypoglycemia, I mean, islet transplant uh, hypoglycemia. This mainly occurs uh, because of um, the lack of uh, glucagon secretion during hypoglycemia. So, you know, when the blood sugar drops, you know, you should get a immediate uh, increase in glucagon and um, in decrease in insulin secretion. So you can see here that uh, total, you know, islet autotransplants tend to not be able to secrete uh, glucagon in response to hypoglycemia, whereas the control subjects and those who have other uh, areas of transplant are able to do that. And it's probably related to the fact that the islets are located in the perisinusoidal space, and they actually see uh, glucose, uh, which is being made by the liver to correct the hypoglycemia, and that kind of suppresses the production of uh, glucagon and actually increases insulin secretion. So that is what uh, may be responsible for, for some of the hypoglycemia that we see after islet autotransplantation. In addition to that, there is uh, elementary hypoglycemia. That means when we do the islet autotransplantation, there's also a Gruen Y type of procedure that is done. We know that um, you know, uh, gastric bypass surgery causes increased GLP-1 secretion and hypoglycemia. So there is elementary hypoglycemia, which suppresses brain recognition of hypoglycemia. There is an increased uh, intrahepatic glucose flux, um, which suppresses glucagon response, and therefore, uh, there's a decrease uh, in uh, glucagon response and hypoglycemia. In the allotransplantation, they're avoiding hypoglycemia um, that usually occurs with exogenous insulin administration. Now they're able to respond better, and they actually have a glucagon response. And so uh, it is something that is um, seen very rarely in allotransplants, but is seen as much as 15 to 30 percent of uh, autoilot transplants. So. Um, you know, one of the uh, things that uh, uh, happens is that this was an interesting article, the COVID-19 and islet transplantation, that the immediate blood-mediated immune um, uh, inflammatory response that occurs is very similar to what happens with COVID. So this being COVID times, you know, this was just published last month in uh, American Journal of Transplantation, uh, looking at the similarities between what happens when you put an islet into the into the liver vasculature, and there is a, a response, uh, but you know this is a self-limiting response. But this is an important source of um, uh, uh, islet loss. So um, you know it is mediated through uh, complement and leukocyte uh, recruitment. Um, so there are multiple efforts to try and decrease this because a very early islet loss uh, can lead to eventual uh, significant decrease in islet function. And finally, I'll talk briefly about islet vasculature. Uh, this is the normal islet blood flow. This is highly vascularized. Uh, and in the um, transplanted islet, uh, there is no um, blood vessel uh, that is perfusing it. It takes anywhere from you know, a few days to a few weeks to establish this uh, islet revascularization. And if you encapsulate an islet, you cannot get the vessels uh, into the uh, islet. So there is significant hypoxia and less nutrient supply, so the function of the islets is going to be uh, impaired. 
So there are a number of ways trying to uh, overcome this uh, procedure, uh, including uh, using scaffolding uh, to uh, pre-vascularize and then introduce the islets uh, into that uh, uh, scaffold, uh, development of vascular channels, uh, pre-vascularization of islet sites um, using techniques that uh, plastic surgeons do for uh, using skin grafts and other things. Uh, then you can use factor release. You know, in, in our experimental models, we had used VEGF, uh, and it can increase uh, very rapidly islet uh, revascularization. Uh, you can use endothelial cell coding or endothelial cell coaggregation. So there are a number of uh, studies that have been going on, including uh, what uh, Stu Williams and Bala had been doing here, and now they're doing at their labs um, outside here. Um, so these are efforts to improve islet function. So in summary, you know, islet autotransplantation following total pancreatectomy, you know, is um, uh, is is very effective uh, in relieving pain, and uh, in a significant number we can get uh, maintain uh, euglycemia. Uh, autotransplant recipients benefit from the pain relief, uh, and uh, occasionally, of course, they uh, have this uh, hypoglycemia problem. Allotransplantation, the main thing that you develop is uh, uh, amelioration of hypoglycemia, on-target glycemic control, improved quality of life. In about half page, the patients uh, who are highly selected, you can get insulin independence. Uh, you may need more than one donor uh, for of pancreas for getting adequate uh, islet function. So um, metabolic outcomes for both uh, auto and islet are really dependent on islets, uh, the number of islets that are transplanted. And there are, of course, novel approaches to um, improve these functions. So I would end by acknowledging uh, my colleagues who have helped me over the years. I already talked about Samuels and Stagner uh, from surgery, Mike Hughes, who really brought this program and is continuing now uh, in his own practice and uh, you know, doing the surgery still at uh, Jewish uh, Islet Lab, uh, Dr. Bala and Stu Williams and their colleagues. Now they have their own um, company, Colligo Therapeutics. Uh, Steve Winters, I must uh, thank him for all the encouragement he gave, even when I was a part-time faculty in continuing my interest. And then a whole bunch of our coordinators, CDs and gastroenterologists and the whole team and our patients and families for helping me uh, understand this whole uh, process uh, and get a better understanding to help others uh, manage their diabetes. So I will end, end here and uh, we'll be glad to take questions. Thanks. All right, if anybody has a question, if you want to, you can unmute your mic and if you want to speak and um, we'll yes. have a question. Okay. I have a quick uh, couple of questions. Uh, thank you for that great talk. This is Dr. Emmons of Heme BMT. Uh, are you familiar with the work of our recently uh, um, uh, faculty member who recently worked left here, Havan Shirwan, on the matrid gel fast ligand expressing matrices that he was using for islet tolerization? Correct. Yes, and uh, I know um, I had been. Uh, you know, when he had applied for some of the NIH grants, I'd worked with him uh, as a co-investigator. Certainly, yeah, I've been familiar with that. It's a very interesting concept. It is one of those things that we use as, you know, uh, immunomodulation um, uh, studies. It's, it is still in the um, animal stages of the, you know, animal experiments, not progress towards uh, in human studies. Uh, although, well, as I understand uh, with his it, collaborators now, uh, at other places, uh, he has been expanding that. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yes, it seems exciting. The other question is, there's a company, Talaris, on campus, of course, who is in the business of uh, tolerization of solid organ transplants, specifically renal uh, transplants currently. But mm -hmm. I wonder if you've uh, approached them at all with regard to their uh, cellular technology for tolerization. Uh, no, I have not. You know, I'm not very familiar with their work. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, that, that would be a very interesting potential sidelight to this. And finally, I wonder what you think of the current status of regenerative medicine produced islet cells, uh, which seem to be moving very far forward in places like Mayo, for example. Uh, is that something that you think is ready for prime time, or where is that? Well, so most of the regenerative studies. Um, 
are able to show that um, there is insulin secretion. Um, the question is, you know, how um, how glucose responsive they are and how much of it uh, can, you know, most of them tend to give you about maybe 30 to 40 percent responses uh, compared to normal humans, you know. Uh, and again, the question is the dynamics of insulin uh, response. And even if I take islet and the pancreas, the pancreas is, they actually give you better response. The pancreas transplants will do, uh, you know, will give better insulin secretion and regulation of blood sugar because the dynamics of the uh, uh, insulin secretion is much well preserved in those situations. So, uh, I mean, those are exciting and we uh, are still waiting to see, you know, that there are you know, more than 40 or so different um, companies and labs that are looking at multiple regenerative techniques to try and develop, uh, like engineer a, a, a islet or regenerate from existing, uh, you know, islets. Yeah, I've been very impressed. I mean, some of them are very far along. The problem doesn't seem to be so much the generation of the islets, it's resolving the insulinitis that's ongoing in the patients who have a primary immune uh, attack. And, Correct. you know, so the Edmonton protocol now, uh, which has been reasonably successful, as developed originally uh, by the Canadians and then exemplified by UMass, and then more recently uh, work by other groups to uh, exemplify, you know, expand on this <clears throat> using cellular techniques have been much more successful. So uh, it does seem that this is sort of on the horizon here fairly soon to make this more successful, especially when mixed with things like the, you know, Matrigel fast ligand expressing work. I, I think we're very close to making this a reality. It's a pretty exciting time. Certainly, you no. Know, um, you know, we, we've been waiting for this for a long time. And Jason, just a point of order, you, you keep putting up today's CME event code uh, in the uh, chat, but there's no code associated with that phrase that you put up. Do you actually have the code for today's CME? I don't know if Jason is there. Jason, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yes, uh, I don't know why. It's, I've been posting it, now, but anyway, the number today is 128. Oh, four, nine, four. I'm not sure why it's been getting cut off in the chat, but I had, uh, I think uh, Dr. Casper had texted me about that as well. So thanks very again, much. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. One again, one, two, eight, oh, four, nine, four. And, uh, and Sri, this is great Mike talk. Hughes. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Hughes. I just want to uh, congratulate you on the talk. It's one of the best talks I've seen covering the practicalities of islet transplantation. And you now have one of the world's largest experience in islet autotransplantation. It'd be interesting to see with your data regarding the normal glucose tolerance versus empirical glucose tolerance when you're evaluating patients pre-op, uh, you know, characterizing the pancreatitis for those patients in those two different groups. Because, you know, as you've seen, we get such advanced disease which results in fewer islets and less insulin independence, whereas if we get patients earlier in their disease process and actually cut off years of pain, we also get more islets and greater insulin independence rates. Um, have you started looking at those data yet in regarding to the chronic pancreatitis? Correct. You know, we um, started collecting some of the data. Um, you know, one of our fellows was working on it, and now he um, graduated, so we are uh, getting know, other people involved trying to get, collect the data again. And uh, we are certainly interested in looking at what the, you know, uh, imaging characteristics or how to quali quantify the degree of uh, fibrosis and so that we can see, you know, is there a relationship to function and whether that function and eventual outcomes, how to relate them, you know, uh, so I think that, in fact, the post study does have those kinds, some of those uh, characteristics, but then, you know, it's still, it'll be still some time before those data can be analyzed. Let's 
can say any more any more any more questions for Dr. Moksha Gundam this morning from anyone? All right, Dr. Moshe Gundam, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it.